steam railway network in Ireland. So I'm afraid there's no steam locomotives. I think there might be one picture at the end, just to kind of keep things. Um, but last week I actually gave this, or I gave a presentation about my research to the Railway Steam Preservation Society of Ireland. Um, and I managed to keep about 150 old men in the room who were mad about steam trains, entertained with pictures of buildings. Um, and I had absolutely no complaints whatsoever. So if it worked for them, it worked for you. Yeah. Um, so my background, I, I, um, my background is art history. Um, so I don't have any formal archaeological research training. So it's very interesting coming to this conference and seeing the way people are obviously doing ground surveys and digging and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I am very much interested in the visual nature and the way we interpret buildings by looking at them. Um, and also the way people interact with them and the history of buildings in that sense. Um, so my research really is um, architectural history. So I'm quite new to industrial archaeology, having only discovered it really about two, two or three years ago when I was doing my masters. Um, and one thing I noticed coming into doing railway studies is an awful lot tends to be around steam trains when it comes to doing railway history. It's all about the steam locomotives, it's all about the trains, the carriages, um, and very little um, is either about the built environment, the bridges, the viaducts, uh, stations, the railway workers, cottages, um, and even less so about the people who actually built them, who worked on them, uh, employed on them, and then broader social implications like sport um, and the impact on women and things like that as well. Um, and the plan for my research is to use um, the artefacts of the buildings as the representational catalysts, basically, for my archaeological research, which is then understanding the society, which evolved, used, and in the case of Ireland, they've abandoned their railway network. So. We all understand what industrial archaeology is, hopefully, you don't need to read it. Um, the main thing that comes out from this quote <coughs> for me is tangible evidence. So for me, the tangible evidence is the railway stations. Um, and like I said, it's not just railway stations I'm looking at, it's the houses, the signal cabins, um, even the way the track still kind of scars the landscape, which we've been forgotten, it's all just linear landscapes um, across Northern Ireland. Um, and this is a picture of Dundalk. A lot of you are thinking I have no idea where the hell that is. I didn't either, don't worry. Um, it's halfway between Dublin and Belfast. It's a border town. What does that mean? That's all kinds of political implications, as I'm sure we can appreciate now, with Brexit happening. Um, um, one thing as well is that this quote also includes the social, economic and technological um, aspects. So we can look at this building like I can, and I can talk about um, the materials that have been used, the design of it. Um, I can talk about uh, the designer, the engineer, um, the way it uh, is the way it is, the type of rooms that are in it. Um, but it's about understanding and interpreting that building and picking it to pieces and understanding how it means. Uh, which is a, a quote by William White, who's an architectural historian, and he claims that we don't just need to understand what buildings mean and what they are, but how they are the way they are. Um, and I think industrial archaeology is quite nicely feeds into that as a discipline of using the built environment of the industrial uh, remains as artefacts and as starting points for that interpretation. Um, and what, again, this comes back to this idea of uh, conserving the industrial past. Like I said, when it comes to railway studies, um, it tends to be about preserving steam locomotives. There are um, preservations of um, train stations. But again, in Ireland in particular, a lot of the train stations aren't listed buildings. Um, a lot of the um, houses aren't listed buildings. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's an area of kind of the recent past, and especially in an Irish context, has put post-colonial uh, connotations to it as well, uh, that, that, that is largely, largely forgotten. Um, and again, it comes down to this idea between conservation and not ways that people work from the past. And I think it's that 
one thing I want to focus on is the ways people worked in the past. So my question really is, has industrial archaeology in relation to railway studies been misapplied um, and misinterpreted um, as to mean conserving railway history as opposed to interpreting it and understanding it? And does that mean that we now need to think of a new term, railway archaeology or railway anthropology? Um, this is the original architectural drawing uh, of the building that you've just seen. Um, this is in the Irish Railway Record Society archives. I have to say that every single time, it drives me insane. Um, and you can look at this and just see it as an architectural drawing. You can see the shapes of the windows, um, and you can say, that's nice, that's great. We've, we've now got a, a copy and we know what the building was designed to look like and what it was designed for. And this largely, as we can see, is how it stands today. And then actually when you start interpreting um, the drawing, this is where society comes in and this is where the interpretation starts to happen. So at the end we have the station master. Has this got a little pointer? Is it thing? Mm -hmm. uh, station master. We have the telegraph office. We talked about communication, so we are. Uh, the general rate waiting room, first and second class. We have a ladies waiting room. <coughs> Four toilets. <laughs> we don't actually get that a lot of uh, railway stations anymore. Um, so already we're starting to see the designation of class, of gender, um, of uh, with, uh, technology as well. Uh, the station master, again, you can't really see it in the pictures, is that he's when you come down the access ramp, the first office you come to is the station master. So very much the presence uh, of authority um, and, um, uh, and kind of officialdom that comes from, from these uh, these station buildings. We then have the next middle room, first and second class refreshment room. Um, this is now a museum, uh, so this has all been removed. But you look at this wonderful, big, sweeping counter, you can just imagine all the kind of bottles and everything in the nice, it would look like a Victorian pub almost, um, lined up along here. You've got loads of windows, you've got these little boxes here. These are draft excluders. So, Again, the first and second class are very much cocooned in. You have a fireplace. Uh, this is the kitchen. This is a nice service hatch down here. I've been into the basement actually down, and the basement itself has no windows, there's no ventilation. It's you know it's not a very nice um, uh, working environment. But but compared to up here, where you can sit back, you've got a platform to the left and a platform to the right. You can sit. You can wait. Uh, you've clearly got money to be lounging around, uh, waiting for your train to turn up. And we compare this uh, to the third class refreshment room, which is two doors. There's no uh, fireplace, there's no room for seats, there's one big long counter, and it's very much a case of you come in, you get what you want, and then you leave. There's no provision for the third class. So again, we're starting to interpret uh, these buildings uh, in their social context. Uh, again, parcels and post office, this is communications and technology again, which has implications for um, literacy, for um, uh, the spread of news in a way that, especially to the west of Ireland, where they usually were about two or three days behind what was happening in the cent centre of government in London, they were then able to actually get it literally within the same day or the next day. Um, and again, this feeds into an Irish context of political uprisings that start to happen. Communication can then actually be fed, uh, people can be mobilised, um, and revolutions, as they were in 1916, the Easter Rising, which happened in 1916, it's a result of the ability of people being able to communicate with each other and to travel to big capital cities, which happened in Dublin. You then have the general waiting room for third class. There's one fireplace there, and then there's two big openings. The ladies' waiting room, urinals, again, lots of nice urinals in there. Um, and a lamp room, which again comes back to the gas lamps. So we can see, um, again, the development of technology and how it's changed. Uh, one thing I do quite like is that the ladies' waiting room for third class and first and second class are exactly the same. So ladies are. Ladies are ladies, we get to have our toilets regardless of which class we're in. Um, now, uh, this brings us to the designer. This is William Hemingway Mills, who's the engineer in chief uh, for the Great Northern Railway. I love the fact that this is signed on the 31st of December. 
So there's no such thing as having a day off, obviously. Um, and this is Joseph Small, signed in March, a year later. Uh, and he is the contractor. So we then start to interpret the drawing as well as interpreting the building. Um, and the drawing is a contract. It's also then a work of art, if you really want to start interpreting it in that way. Um, and it should be preserved and, and viewed in its aesthetic terms, as well as the fact that it was obviously used um, as, a, as a design contract. So this is uh, William Hemingway Mills here on the left. He was actually from Yorkshire. Uh, he worked for the Midland Railway initially under William, Heming uh, William Henry Barlow, who was responsible for St Pancras's big train shed. Um, he then worked in Scotland, Spain and Mexico before coming to Ireland. So again, we think of Irish railways, we think of them being maybe a little bit provincial, um, but in actual fact, they had huge international influences and their engineers were world-renowned. And it's actually only because of history um, that we largely don't know anything about them. Uh, the man up here, this is uh, John McNeil. He was Irish and he was born in County Loud. He um, apprenticed under Thomas Telford um, and actually finished... Uh, when Thomas Telford died before the A5 was completed, it was actually John McNeil that completed the roads that went to Holyhead and then the steamer train that went to Dublin and it all connected up by, by rail. Um, again, how many people have actually heard of of John McNeil. Nobody, right, there we go. Um, and he's actually quite involved in a lot of British railway projects as well. He largely worked in England before coming back to Ireland. There we go. We're all too busy talking about William L. Um, <laughs> and this is William Darwin. William Darwin was uh, an Irish magnate and an engineer. So he actually financed about 80% of Irish railways. Um, he was responsible for the Dublin to Dunleary um, Railway, which opened in 1833, that was the first railway line um, in Ireland, and he also completely financed uh, the Great Exhibition of Dublin in 1853. Um, I wonder if I put a picture of it in. No, I didn't. Um, basically, a massive replica of the Crystal Palace was built in the centre of Dublin. It's actually, if anybody knows Dublin or is planning on visiting, um, it's where the National Gallery of Ireland is situated now. Uh, which he subsequently, when the, when the exhibition hall was dismantled, funded um, the National Gallery. There's a dog and wing um, in the gallery, and there's also a nice uh, statue of the man himself outside the front door. Um, so we also then talk about people. By and large, railway studies focuses on the engineers. What about the people who actually built the railways? Uh, especially in an Irish context, navvies are incredibly important. They not only worked in Ireland, they worked in England. Um, which again, they kind of just get a side mention. Um, and in actual fact, they made up about sort of 70% of the workforce. They were paid half as much. Um, they also built the Union um, Pacific uh, Railway in, uh, in America, along with Chinese labourers. And Chinese labourers were paid in opium. Um, and the Irish labourers were actually paid, but again, what they used to have is um, they get paid in, in, in vouchers. And those vouchers could only be um, used in the local bar, and then everybody wonders why the Irish are famous for drinking. Um, along with employment, then you have uh, workers' rights, you have insurance claims, the rise of trade unions, health and safety at work, all this kind of thing. Uh, I love this picture, this is fantastic. Um, this is an employee, I mean, you look at his uniform, the man's obviously very happy in his job. Uh, again, there's social status, there's power. The station master would have actually had a house as well. Um, so again, the architecture is uh, is reflecting um, uh, the, the people that would have worked um, on the railways. And also one thing is women. Um, there were female employees of the Great Northern Railway. They were largely clerks. They had their own designated female working offices, which I actually think is quite a nice idea. Um, but they had to do psychological tests, whereas the men didn't. And I'm yet to find out what the questions are, but there were three of them. Um, and there's one uh, results page where one woman scored five out of five for all of them, mm -hmm. and one woman got zero, one, and zero, and subsequently obviously wasn't, was, wasn't offered the job. Um, and I wonder what the, what the tests were. I'm not sure. She was obviously unhinged, and didn't want to be told. Um, this is at Kildare 
station and this man, the man from Del Monte, is selling bananas, oranges and apples. Um, and I love this idea, this is in 1935. Uh, and we've got Denny's, which are famous Irish sausages, um, being advertised uh, in the background. So it's all to do with diet as well and uh, the availability, because of the railways, of, of foreign and exotic foods. Um, and this is the GNRI standardised butter wagon, which, is, uh, which again changed homesteads as well and meant that people could have access to um, they could buy butter, basically, instead of having to, to produce it themselves. Again, the impact on women, uh, freedom to travel. Uh, with something's going on there. She doesn't look very happy. Um, she's obviously running errands. All the kids leaning out the window. I think it's an absolutely fantastic picture. I love that. Um, and then we also have tourism, the Great Northern Hotel. So all the, the railway companies used to build their own hotels. Um, and then advertise them, and they also used to build golf courses, so then have impact on sport. Uh, and it's interesting, this poster is designed by Margaret Borden, so we have a female artist depicting women playing golf and going swimming in the west of Ireland. So all of these impacts all come from, from ra railway studies. And I can't talk about Ireland without, of course, mentioning famine and all the British people in here, including myself, can shift uncomfortably in their seats. <laughs> um, the Great Famine was from 1845 to 1849, um, but it has lasting effects even to this day, politically in particular. Um, some, um, some historians have actually called it genocide by the British, who were the landowners at the time, uh, with de deliberate acts of eviction, starvation, um, and land clearances. Um, the trains aided this. Um, the henchmen, if you like, uh, of the landowners could uh, travel much, much more quickly to these rural areas um, to actually evict people and also um, uh, evict people from the country and send them off to places like Australia because then they can actually be quickly and easily shipped out of the country. Um, so, do I have time? Um, how long have I got left? I'm just going to... Seven minutes. Seven minutes. That's fine. Yeah. So I'm just going to read an excerpt. Um, this is from uh, a book by Tom Ferris, which is about um, the history of Irish railways, and this is about immigration. Another theme which emerges from writers who recorded their journeys by rail around Ireland towards the end of the 19th century is the all-pervading presence of emigration. With seemingly every train on which they travelled, witnessing heartrending scenes as children left their, fa their parents for, uh, for maybe the last time to seek some sort of life away from the economic wasteland which was post family Ireland. The playwright, jo uh, John Middleton Singh, um, records one such scene which he witnessed on a journey from Truly to Mallow, which is uh, in, in Kerry, um, as some young people began their journey to Queenstown. Queenstown is now Cove near Cork, and just as a point of reference, um, it was the last stop that the Titanic made before it went on its, on its way, uh, and the emigrant ship. So same rights. Um, this always gets me, so I'll, I'll try and hold it to um, At several stations, girls and boys thronged in to get places to Queenstown, leaving parties of old men and women wailing with anguish on the platform. At one place, an old woman was seized with such a passion of regret when she saw her daughters moving away from her forever that she made a wild rush after the train and when I looked out for a moment I could see her <coughs> writhing and struggling on the platform with her hair over her face and two men holding her back by the arms. So you can see the impact the railways obviously had on people. That's the first time I've read that without crying. Um, so we can see the impact that the railways had on people. Um, so is this industrial archaeology or is this railway anthropology? This is one of the station master's houses. Again, this is a nice example. You can see how the company is using brick branding, is what I like, is, is what I call it, um, to, to bring the, the network together. Obviously, I'm not focusing on that today, um, but that's just a nice example. So if we think of railway anthropology, the practical application of industrial archaeology in relation to railways has become almost inextricably entwined with the more single-minded purpose of preserving and running steam locomotives, much out of context with true historical aspects. 
So hopefully you can see um, there's much more to railway studies than there is locomotives. And, and I, I wonder why this is. A lot of um, the time I give, I give presentations, it is, like I said, to a room of kind of former railway engineers, uh, all in their 60s, 70s and 80s, and all staring back at me, and you think, by and large, that's probably why. There we go. <laughs> I said I'd put one in. Um, so, one thing I would argue, and this is just to say, is Coop Hill Station. This is an absolute, so this still stands. Um, it's beautiful, it's absolutely stunning. It's all stone and it, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, it's now being used as a cattle market canteen. Uh, and this is in the middle of County Cavern. And if anybody who knows Ireland, you'll know that that's in the middle of, middle of, middle of, middle of everywhere. Um, I would argue that industrial archaeology is people rather than things. Um, and therefore, the term like railway archaeology or railway anthropology isn't actually needed. It's just a case of interpreting industrial archaeology and applying it as it was originally intended to be. So, just to summarise, has the definition of industrial archaeology been misinterpreted as the study and preservation of technology rather than of the society in which it was created? And could anthropological approaches to railway studies be the truest application of industrial archaeology, meaning new term is not required, but the original methodologies be applied? I was going to say correctly applied, but I think that kind of infers that industrial heritage then isn't correct, and I don't, I don't think that's, I don't think that's, that's true. Um, so I would say that a new term isn't needed because industrial archaeology is um, specific enough to apply to various aspects, like for example factories um, uh, of uh, industrial history, but it's also broad enough to be applied across many social interpretations. And I'm going to leave it there, and just to say that my um, PhD research, I have my own blog, uh, and what I'm planning on doing, I've started to do, is every, there's over 141 stations that I have to visit as part of my research. I've visited 20 so far. Um, each station, I'm writing its own history as it goes along, and that is linked with development of the site, development of the land, um, and a lot of public engagement has come back from that. People are actually really, uh, this thing of people wanting to really share their memories um, and wanting some of those original drawings that I have. Where do I get a copy of that? You've got a drawing of my house, and I want to see a picture of it. Um, and I'm on Twitter. Mike always retweets absolutely everything I post, so I'm very thankful for that. Uh, and I'm on Instagram as well. That's it, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.